Justice Belinda Ang, Justice Kanan Ramesh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm saying on from the Singapore Mediation Center, and on behalf of the organizers, the SMC, the Singapore Management University, and Evershed's Harry Elias LLP, I would like to welcome you to the seventh annual Singapore Mediation Lecture. I would like to thank Evershed's Harry Elias LLP for their generous sponsorship of the Singapore Mediation Lecture. Special thanks also to Mr. Manoj Sharma, founder and CEO of Castro.com for being here. Today, we will be using Castro, the Castro platform, uh, which uses AI during our panel discussion. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in case you have not done so, please scan the QR code on your iOS cameras or Bixby Vision on your Android phones anytime. And please be sure to ask questions during the, anytime during the lecture. Allow me to introduce our guest speaker for today. We are really privileged and excited to have Ms. Joanna Kalowski as our speaker. Ms. Kalowski is a mediator, facilitator and judicial educator. She has a background as an adult educator and designs, leads and evaluates programs for lawyers and judges. She's on the Resolution Institute's advanced panel, the panel of the Centre de Médiation et d'Arbitrage de Paris, and the International Panel of the Singapore Mediation Centre. Ms. Kalowski served on the Administrative Appeals Tribunal in Australia from 1988 to 1996, and the National Native Titles Tribunal from 1996 to 1999, and thereafter remained as a presidential consultant. In 2008, she was appointed to the International Mediation Institute, where she served on the Independent Standards Commission and co-chaired the reference group that determined IMI standards in intercultural mediation. Ms. Kalowski has mediated over 300 cases, ranging from environmental and native title disputes to partnership and commercial matters. Her achievements have been recognized by the Who's Who Legal in 2017, to the, sorry, Who's Who Legal in 2017, ranking her third on the list of mediators active in Australia. Let's put our hands together to welcome Ms. Joanna Kalowski. Well, if you're pleased to see me, I'm even more pleased to see you. Singapore is a place that I love, uh, which I've visited many times, and something around 18 or 17 years ago, I had the great pleasure of coming and running a workshop um, with, uh, and that's where I met Sengon and uh, many of the members of the Singapore um, Mediation Centre. Uh, in its very, very beginnings, and I could see then what you know now to be the case, which is that the Mediation Centre has taken its rightful place, and indeed the University with its teaching has taken their rightful place among the leaders of the Mediation Universe, I do believe. And this will, can only be changed uh, for the better with the announcement of the Singapore Convention about which we'll talk more later, but I'll certainly cover that a little tonight. So once again, distinguished guests and all guests, thank you very much for the honour and privilege of inviting me to give this lecture. Um, I've called it On Tiptoes Through the Minefield, Cultural Dimensions of Mediation, because wherever you look in the area of culture, there is controversy. And I'll start this way. Forgive me for reading, but when I'm nervous, if I speak, um, I will go on forever. And my Aboriginal colleagues in Australia tell me that I am famous for being able to speak underwater with a loaf of bread in my mouth. And that translates as, from a very quiet community, as being someone who talks too much. So on the 23rd of August, I participated, this year, I participated in the session on current developments in mediation, the UNCITRAL draft convention and model law on enforcement of settlements at the International Law Association Congress held in Sydney. The title of this year's Congress 
was developing international law in challenging times. Challenging times indeed. Emeritus professor and my colleague Catherine Kasedjian of Paris 2, who had been an observer in the formulation of the convention, presented her views. I was commentator, and we then opened the floor for what turned out to be a lively discussion. To give you a flavor of the discussion, the following issues and questions were among those canvassed, and it may very well, they may very well reflect the sorts of questions you would like to ask at the end of this lecture. The first one was this. The UN Commission on Trade Law already has a convention on conciliation. Is this change to mediation nothing more than a change of terminology? Two, if it is not, what does the use of the term mediation in this context signify? Is it because mediation is beginning to be more widely used in international settings or because they want to encourage its use? Three, is the Singapore Convention principally aimed at easing enforcement of negotiated settlements after successful mediation? And four, if mediation is so successful, why is the convention necessary at all? Five, why are there so many grounds to oppose enforcement? Professor Kesejian counts 11. Six, does Article 5 point to a more structured style of mediation in some parts of the world? Seven, the grounds for resisting enforcement resemble the New York Convention grounds, and one has to hope they would be narrowly interpreted. Eight, there seems no capacity to invoke hardship provisions, and that could be an important addition. Nine, the Austrian branch of the International Law Association said this, settlements in Austria are recorded as awards by consent, not as settlements as such. So what are the benefits of enforcement over awards by consent? 10. It's unclear at the moment whether and at what point parties can call on the New York Convention. 11. Can parties contract out of Article 5? The Singapore Convention is silent on this point. After all, fraud and deceptive conduct would always be available to challenge a settlement agreement. No more of those for now. As I listened to the debate and joined in the discussions, it occurred to me that in the context of creating binding commercial agreements in an international context, mediators might find that more is expected of them by business, particularly in the intercultural arena. The UNSA trial convention for mediated settlement agreements, to be known as the Singapore Convention, is likely to increase the use of mediation in cross-border disputes and matters, and it's bound to make intercultural issues even more pertinent. Given your geographic position, Singapore is likely to be the site of many of those mediations. In fact, I don't doubt it. How to choose mediators to conduct those matters is, I suggest, an important consideration for business and government parties. Much has been said and written about culture and its influence on thought, behavior, action. Until the advent of the neuroscience revolution, what could not be understood through the lens of one group's expectations of another was sheeted home to the culture of that other, and there it remained incognito. Quite apart from the fact that we are none of us on cultural autopilot 24 hours a day, and that it's a nonsense that our responses and reactions can all be sheeted home to culture. Neuroscience can now shed light on why people see the same phenomenon and interpret it in different ways. It also usefully sheds light on the phenomenon of priming and the ways in which cultural influences predispose us to see the same issue so differently. Let me quickly illustrate. A very quick task for you. Why is that fish swimming in front of the others? So you might like to answer in your own heads or have a look at it and think about it. 
But the most fascinating thing about this is depending on how you are primed before you see this, you either think that the front fish is the leader or is being chased. Now, if we know that from some, it's, it's part of a very, very interesting neuroscientific study. And very often, also, there are very differences, there are very great differences in how people see this. Because when you show this slide to Americans, they immediately say that the front fish is the leader. And in other settings, people say that front fish is somehow out of line and the others are chasing him or her. I don't think her comes into it. So how does this affect us as mediators? I'm very aware that when I was doing native title mediation, which sounds as if it's simply mediation with indigenous parties, and yes it is, but very often the respondent party was a very large mining company, for example BHP Coal. And I did one mediation in which a BHP Coal was on one side of the table and an indigenous community was on the other and there was huge anger in the room because the indigenous community kept looking at me and saying, these bastards, if you'll pardon my Australianism, are only here because they now have to be. They've been mining our land for 90 years and they've never asked permission until now. And of course, the very literal engineers on the side of BHP and their lawyers said, I'm not even 45, so how can you accuse me of doing something 90 years ago? And I had to say, they're speaking figuratively, you know, let them go. But what I found really, really helped was at a certain point, because I wanted to break through this hostility, I happened to say, there have been many such mediations that have started in this way, but that have ended very successfully. May I show you a template of an agreement? And I had devised a temp template which looks like an umbrella. And the umbrella is a native title outcome, an agreement that these people are the traditional owners of this land and that certain activities are permitted on that land by them and others by negotiation. And hanging off that umbrella like the spokes of an umbrella are agreements with the tel telecommunications authority, agreements with fisher people, agreements with with beekeepers, agreements with agricultural producers, agreements with tour operators and local councils, all manner of agreements. And what happened was people started to prefigure the idea of settlement. And I didn't realise until afterwards when I spoke to my neuroscience colleagues that that was a classic example of priming. That I had given people a sense that despite what they were feeling now, settlement was what we would do. I didn't dwell, even though I had to dwell, I didn't dwell only on the hostility of the moment, which was real and needed to be dealt with. I prefigured the idea that these matters and matters like them can and have been settled. So the way we prime people the way we now use what we know about making people, putting people in the mindset that will lead to settlement is of enormous difference, particularly when the cultures are so, so very different. Let me continue then. Business users and countries embarking on international negotiations can hardly be expected to stop and ask themselves whether their style of negotiation and their approach to settlement will be shared by their counterparts. This will fall to mediators whose role increasingly will be to facilitate durable solutions precisely because they're adept at mediating interculturally. In 2014, in this very city, I co-chaired a committee of the International Mediation Institute with the task of setting the criteria for IMI accreditation as an intercultural mediator. The committee members, and one of them is sitting right in front of me, my very old colleague, Joel Lee. The committee members were from Singapore, Switzerland, the US, Sweden via Holland, New Zealand, Russia, and Australia. 
I promise you it was quite an experience. You can find those criteria on the IMI website, and I think we fought our way through to the end of them. We developed a term to cover the range of concerns that we felt useful for mediators to take account of, and we called them cultural focus areas. They now seem to me to be useful preparation tools for representatives of parties entering international negotiations. They include, among other things, communication style, formal, informal, direct, indirect, mindset towards conflict, risk taking, high or low, relationship versus task orientation, the nature of the process itself, the roles parties and mediators play, predictability, social protocols, time orientation, decision making styles. There are others, but these few give you an idea of our thinking. Each cultural focus area has a subset of topics intended to lead mediators to consider in advance the possible approach of the parties they are working with and how to accommodate different approaches. Let us assume then that a growing body of interculturally skilled men and women will be available to mediate the kinds of international commercial matters, not necessarily disputes, that the Singapore Convention governs. How will they differ from other mediators? And how will business users of mediation and their legal advisors be able to judge and select them? It occurred to me, as I listened to the discussions at the International Law Association, that little was said about the cause of failed intercultural mediations, which is a useful starting point, and I'm fond of saying that nothing succeeds like failure, because you always remember what you did wrong, and it's such a useful spur to not doing it again. In my experience, parties to significant mediations do not negotiate in bad faith. I must say, I hope those of you who are mediators here or who are business users of mediation agree with me. There is very rarely bad faith. The occasional fishing expedition isn't unheard of. You know, the kind of exchanges structured to lead the other side into disclosing things that they didn't necessarily intend to reveal, or the types of questions designed to see what kind of witness the other side would make if the negotiations fail and the matter ends up in court. No, the far more common cause of failure is what I like to term intercultural blindness, or the assumption that when sophisticated commercial parties negotiate, they're operating on a shared platform, um, loosely termed the Western industrial model. To some extent, this is undeniably true. And it suits Western countries to believe this and may even absolve them from the need to ask whether the way they conduct business is the best way or even the only way. A study conducted in Sri Lanka revealed that anthropologists were in strong disagreement with Western, mostly American, trauma specialists who rushed in to mount a campaign to deal with the post-traumatic stress that they assumed would follow that country's, the end of that country's bloody and protracted civil war. Puzzled by the unexpected reactions of local populations, especially those where perpetrators and victims continued to live side by side, traumatologists in, embarked on a campaign to educate the survivors as if local populations were utterly unaware of what happens to the human mind after terrible events. Arthur Kleinman, a medical anthropologist from Harvard University, put his finger on precisely what was happening. Most of the disasters in the world, he says, happen outside the West, yet we come in and pathologize their reactions as if they don't know how to live with this situation. And here's the key sentence that he wrote. We take their cultural narratives away from them and impose ours. Imposing one side's cultural narrative on another, or worse, imposing the mediators on both, 
is hardly helpful in international negotiations, whether traumatic or not. I wonder, uh, I wonder how often, uh, no, I'm sorry, my colleagues in the business of peacemaking, however, tell me it's a critical issue and the greatest care must be taken not to make the situation worse by falling into this trap. I wonder how often a failed mediation arises not merely out of differences between the parties, as we mediators like to believe, but rather from the mediator's failure to grasp key intercultural narratives that need to be woven into the discussions and into the agreements. Negotiations start out well enough, but when problems arise, so does heightened se sensitivity as to why the others are not playing ball or playing along or playing by the rules. This is when parties revert to tried and true tactics, by definition tactics that have worked for them before, either because they're used to being the more powerful party or because they've been negotiating with like-minded parties, parties with a similar mindset, culturally speaking. While both may well operate on similar Western industrial terrain, they do not put aside their cultural assumptions and preferences. Indeed, they are often seeking to satisfy them in this very matter. Where much rides on the outcome of a dispute or a negotiation, parties know they're in the spotlight. The level of scrutiny to which they're subjected by their board or by their government makes them hypersensitive to the risk of failure. I include parties' legal representatives in this, who are often as understandably nervous as the parties themselves and can become negative advocates for the parties, for their clients. So let us assume in high-stakes negotiations there is tension and hyper-arousal, sensitivity to the risk of failure, and to the least hint of a slight on the national character of the party or its national or international preoccupations. One has only to read how Israelis and Palestinians negotiate a cross-cultural analysis of the Oslo peace process to recognize how close parties have come to agreement in international affairs only to slide apart at the last moment. The role of culture in the failed Oslo negotiations is cogently put in the, in the introduction to this work. And here's the quote. Culture plays a subtler and more multifaceted role than simply provoking misunderstanding. Culture's role in this case is best understood as an intervening variable that operates at different levels through the impact of cultural identity and cultural categories of thinking on political leaders, on the domestic politics of each side that constrain the negotiations, and on each side's evaluation of the other's beliefs and intentions regarding the issue being negotiated. Thus, culture has an intermediary and multidimensional role and can't be reduced to either or dichotomies any more than success or failure can be wholly attributed to culture. We are entering a minefield best to tread carefully on tiptoes. I've often been asked how I came to be so interested in questions of culture. I then tell stories of my earliest childhood where I was the interpreter for my German-speaking grandparents who raised me while my refugee parents both worked and German is my first language. Every Friday, my grandmother, dressed in her dark European clothes, wearing short, laced-up boots, which nobody in Australia ever wore, especially in our climate, with an apron pinned to her dress, not tied around the neck, but pinned on, would take me shopping with her, and I was the spokes shopper. I vividly remember, when I was about five or six, that she made me ask the butcher how much chicken livers cost. He looked at both of us with an expression I will never forget and simply told us to come back in the late afternoon. I translated this for my Oma 
and we went back at closing time. You must understand that in those days, chicken was expensive and considered a delicacy not like today. And Australian families bought one for, lunch, uh, for Sunday lunch or a special occasion, if at all. Butchers, therefore, typically prepared chickens for sale on Fridays. And no one but refugees from Europe like us ate chicken livers. So here we were, purse in hand, ready to go in and buy the chicken livers. There stood the butcher on the doorstep, holding a big paper-wrapped parcel, and I have to tell you, the paper was quite stained. As we approached, he took a step towards us and handed my grandmother the parcel. Puzzled, she looked past him into the shop and held out her hand with the money in it. He just shook his head and went back inside and we walked away with what must have been two kilos of beautiful, fresh chicken livers. My grandmother was overwhelmed and delighted at his generosity and talked about it over and over again. I, however, had the clear impression that he didn't want us in his shop and was suddenly and for the first time conscious of our strange language, our strange clothes and our strange ways. But in the end, who was right? My grandmother or my five-year-old self? Perhaps we both were. And certainly my grandmother was right. They did give meat away free in Australia. I'm sure that after starving in post-war Germany, it must have been a very reassuring thought for her. And who was I to say that she was wrong? And can I now be certain of the butcher's motives? I recognised early what my culture of origin predisposed me to believe and to value, while at the same time recognising that the host culture, Australian society, had very different expectations and very different behaviours. Unusually, I suspect, I saw my own culture in contrast to the other in very clear ways. I had a foot in both camps. Discomfort is good training for mediation. Intercultural blindness is not deliberate. Rather, it's normal. It is ethnocentricity, and we are all ethnocentric, which translates really as most at home in our own cultural environment. Intercultural blindness is the product of what a Japanese colleague of mine calls the inability to recognise that the way one operates is not universal, but has specific features that are embedded as values, beliefs and expectations. When these fail to materialise, people are at best puzzled and at worst angry. They are quite literally at sea. My colleague asks people to consider what culture is and how their own has shaped them. When he asks that question, he's greeted by silence, especially in the West, in countries like the US where he lives and works, but also in Australia. So he follows up with a question that extends my watery analogy. He asks, do fish know they're in water? You can imagine what follows. People discover that their assumptions and expectations about human behaviour are time, place and culture specific. They realise it, they realise that it's only when they're fish out of water. And in the absence of the things they expect, need, even crave, that they recognise a set of values and beliefs they can properly call their own culture. And only then can they name them. In the literature of the intercultural, this is known as gap perception. To sum it up, those who don't expect some phenomenon to be present don't see a gap. For those who do expect a next step which fails to materialise, the gap can be a shock or a yawning chasm. They are thrown into confusion by the absence of something they usually rely on in order to feel that they're on solid ground. A UK academic working in Australia once referred to migration not as grappling with a new world, but living with the shock of the absence of the known world. I first came across the idea of gap perception when I was a young 
um, person working for government at the New South Wales Anti-Discrimination Board, we had noticed that there were a large number of business failures and that many of the business people whose businesses had failed were of Greek background. So we there was a great deal of discussion about it and in the newspapers uh, the usual somewhat racist suggestions that Greeks made bad immigrants and that they were somehow fundamentally dishonest. So we ran a session in which we invited many of these business owners to come to the Anti-Discrimination Board and to discuss what might be going on because we had no idea. And we called on an interpreter and because there were many people who were elderly and while their English was okay if you were buying something from them over the counter, they couldn't get involved in these intense discussions unless there was an interpreter present. So we had this very interesting interpreter, excellent interpreter, who when we said, uh, you know, I said to the group, for example, did you incorporate for limited liability? And the question that she then asked the group using Greek was, la 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 la, limited liability. And I said, no, 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 please use the Greek expression. And she said, there is no such expression. It doesn't exist. If you start a business in Greece, you can hang up a shingle and call it Bill's Shoe Shop or Joanna's Kitchen. And if it fails, you walk away. You don't have to incorporate for limited liability. And when you're left with all of these, you know, with a, with a bankruptcy effectiveness, effectively, and owing a huge amount of money, perhaps on your family home, and then you try to get out of it, the result is what we saw. So I then developed a phenomenon that I constantly use in the intercultural universe, which is if you come across something which is not translatable into another language, you've stumbled upon a cultural phenomenon, not a linguistic one. So we had to have someone who said, in Australia there is a phenomenon called limited liability. And what it means in Greek is that if you start a business, you have to ensure that you've signed papers that say the following. And everyone was going, ah, ah, ah. So then we knew what had happened to this vast group of business people. And that, that exercise was replayed many times with different waves of immigrants who were simply going into small business, as immigrant families often do, unaware, literally not knowing what they didn't know. So, you know, I love that story because gap perception is something that you perceive the more you operate in more than one setting, as you do all the time because you're such a diverse society. My colleague Joel Lee and his co-author Te Wee Wee in their scholarly book An Asian Perspective on Mediation set out a cultural continuum which I've often referred to as helping demonstrate the part culture plays in conflict and that its resolution depends on the world view of the proponent and will shape the proponent's choice of intervention as well as adherence to certain modes and models of mediation. Surely this explains the sterile debates we've all heard as to whether this or that approach is best, as if one size fits all. So as I listened to the discussion on the draft convention, it occurred to me that several significant issues had gone unmentioned in the discussions. The first was the role of relationship building. Oh no, relationship in commercial matters. Who, who would have guessed it? The nature of voluntary agreements. Futurity, certainty and satisfaction. Most important of all, none of the attendees who spoke mentioned party satisfaction as key to successful outcomes, which I define as durable outcomes. You can have a terrific outcome on the day which falls over the next week. I turn to these four issues in the intercultural context in the expectation that business users of mediation will be alive to their importance and will ensure that they're built into agreements to the extent they as parties desire and require. 
Mediators have traditionally been trained to view success as a deal concluded between the parties, and why not? If they've worked hard to enable a deal to be done, and it answers the needs of the parties, they have a right to be pleased and to regard the mediation as a success. Parties normally place a high value on certainty, and that translates as, to mediators as helping them to conclude the deal. But it doesn't end there. All too often in complex international, intercultural commercial settings, circumstances change rapidly and the deal that looked so promising yesterday no longer suits today, let alone tomorrow. In other words, futurity and certainty may clash. Peter Adler, my first teacher in mediation, calls the complex mediations done today second or even third wave mediations. And last, week's, last year's distinguished lecturer, Professor Carrie Menkel Meadow, talked about mediation 3.0 in much the same terms. In first and second wave mediations between two or more individuals or companies, mediation is simply an alternative to taking a matter to court, usually because the law governing the transaction is clear and the outcome or range of possible outcomes is known and predictable. That is no longer the case. Rapidly changing national and international circumstances, the speed of innovation, the rate of obsolescence and the complexity of the issues we face make it likely that even a straightforward deal, uh, make it less likely that even a straightforward deal will be a once and for all settlement. It may be subject to change and will need modification, so the parties to it will have to be open to renegotiating some or all of it at some time in the future. Future dealings may well have to be built into agreements with an emphasis on ways of improving upon, adding to or deleting aspects of an agreement reached today in the name of keeping it relevant to unforeseen and unforeseeable events. So certainty is a goal, not a guarantee. This issue takes on a cultural tinge when it's passed through the filter of short and long-term orientations. In Paris, where I've lived a few months of the year for the past 20 years, they tell a terrific joke to illustrate this point. I'll tell you the joke. President Mitterrand decides to pay a visit to Chairman Mao and to ask him for his views on the French Revolution. Mao leans back in his chair, looks up reflectively, and then turns to the president and says, interesting question, I'd like to comment, but it's too soon to tell. Now, the French tell that, and everybody hoots with laughter, because after all, 1789 is such a long time ago. And yet, we, they tell that joke to remind themselves that for some through some worldviews, it's not quite long enough yet to be certain of the settled outcome. Because, you know, any time that um, Emmanuel Macron tries to introduce any kind of change, everybody's out in the streets. During my last visit, which ended 10 days ago, there was a demonstration by doctors, there was a demonstration by people running the trains and the buses, try to make a change and they honour the revolutionary spirit and they all get out in the streets. In Australia, people would grumble about it and order their next beer or their next coffee, but not in France. They have to honour this revolutionary spirit and get out and march in numbers and block the street in which I live because it's on one of these major boulevards. So, as you in this ro room know only too well, cultures high on long-term orientation value long-term commitments cultivate a respect for tradition and look for future rewards. Cultures low on this scale look towards immediate results and are more amenable to change. So mediators have their work cut out for them. If one party wants the deal signed now, signed and sealed now, and the other foresees the need to keep talking well into the future. Where one party favours a long-term view of events and the other has a rather more short-term focus, conflict can arise over the mediator's choice of process and approach. 
Parties who want a binding agreement now will balk at the idea that they should invest time in building the relationship between them as a safeguard for future developments. It is as, it is as if the future were another country and they will simply apply for a visa to go there if ever the need arises. With that, they dismiss as irrelevant the need to invest in relationship building. I've seen it all too often. And it's not hard to see why the long-term types see the short-termers as transactional, dismissive and uncommitted, while the short-termers see the long-termers as unwilling to do the hard work of sorting it all out now and ac accuse them of postponing the hard work that has to be done now. Is this an unbridgeable gap? In the hands of a skilled and active mediator, it need not be. Simply using the agenda of issues under discussion to identify those with future ramifications and setting them aside as worthy of further attention can enable very differently disposed parties to follow the mediator's lead. Passivity doesn't work in this setting, I fear. The what would you like to do now approach of the pure transformative practitioners can itself produce conflict. I'm fond of saying that freeing parties from process is high on the list of what mediation offers, although there will be moments when the mediator senses or asks for parties' input into where to go next. I did it recently in a mediation and said, look, everyone's looking tired, I myself am quite tired, shall we take a break? And somebody looked at me and said, be quiet, we were just getting somewhere. Now, I did that partly because I was tired, but I have to say I was refreshed by the party's energy. They clearly were not going to go with me into a break when they felt that progress was being made. So I have no problem with doing that at all. But I do think that we share the leadership of these processes. So process decisions are ideally imperceptible, and I like to think of process as the water that various species of fish can swim in together. Freed from the need to make actual process decisions, parties can focus on content. After all, that's what they've come to do. In high-stakes negotiations with international ramifications, the parties come with concerns but they need to leave with high hopes. And if that's not emotional, I don't know what is. If they've satisfied one another's need to build trust and preserve social harmony, however it's been achieved, so much the better. After all, turning your adversary into an emissary, as Roger Fisher famously said, is the essence of good negotiation. Even when the negotiation is over, the parties continue to maintain the sense of respect that was a byproduct of their successful dealings, not merely a byproduct of the outcome. It's surprising how often failed or stalled commercial mediations can be traced to a loss of trust and confidence in the process and the mediator, and I'm going to offer you a real example. A London colleague and I were asked to debrief representatives of a Danish and an English company negotiating a very valuable joint venture. Uh, their mediation in the UK had just ended in stalemate. And we'd been asked to go in and talk to them and see if we could get the matter back on the rails. A number of interesting issues emerged from our discussions with the parties and their legal representatives. And we saw each party and their legal representatives separately. We didn't see the legal representatives separately from the parties. It became clear that the Danes' focus was on relationship building and gathering information to assist later discussions, while the English company representatives assumed, this is so fascinating, that the relationship would begin when the deal was done. And for me, that was absolutely fascinating. The English also felt they now had sufficient information on which to proceed to a deal and that they could iron out any problems later as the working relationship developed. You know, they could, in this instance, they could both be right. Remember that in their own view, both are right. No one is actually technically wrong here. By the time we met them, 
They saw one another as evasive and deceptive, and those are the very words they used. It turned out that two days had been set aside for the mediation, and it had been agreed that English would be the common language. It's so easy when there's shared language to assume that all or much else is also shared. Things started to go wrong when the mediator reminded the parties there was only half a day to go and it was time to put ideas on the table. I asked the parties what words the mediator used and the answer was that he said, let's get going. Action orientation may seem normal to one party, but it's not necessarily so for both. It's a component of intercultural mediation, well worth exploring. When those words were spoken, the Danes fell silent. The English party, feeling a deal was imminent, filled the silence with their ideas. They were disconcerted when there was no engagement from the other side. Perfectly reasonable. The mediator suggested private sessions and in caucus asked the parties for proposals to further the negotiations. The Danes made none. Things went seriously off the rails when the mediator returned to the British party and informed them that there was no reaction to their ideas and that the Danes had none of their own. Can you see this sliding away? There are two parts to that message and the interculturally skilled mediator needs to know how to convey both. The mediator could have come to see the English party and instead of stating that there was no reaction to their ideas, could have asked them why they thought it was that their Danish counterparts were not responding. This is a classic display of deference. And why do we mediators need to practice deference? because the parties know one another far better than the mediator possibly could, and posing a question for them to ponder might just have assisted them to recognise that the Danes quite simply weren't ready. They could then have instructed their mediator to extend the time available, bring them back together to explore further. Simple, yet it didn't happen. Reflection time might also have helped them all, mediator included, to realise that the moment was not right for this stage and that something else needed to be done right now to bridge a potential difficulty. It might also have allowed everyone to turn their mind to what was not happening and why, instead of persevering with what normally happens round about now and placing a successful outcome at risk. Another possibility here is the importance of two concepts that are crucial to intercultural mediation, consideration of task and relationship. It appeared that minimal time had been devoted to building the relationship. There had been an excessive focus on the deal when there was an expectation on the Danish side that this mediation was about building a platform of trust for working together into the future before uh, before and as well as framing the deal. These preferences, whether cultural or stylistic in origin, are imperceptible to those for whom they are normal. This is another sort of gap perception. They can't state them because they're inherent, inchoate, taken for granted. If the parties lack those insights, the mediator must possess them and be able to explore the expectations that underlie behaviours. So the mediator could well have said to the, uh, to the Danish party, look, I'm a bit surprised that you aren't saying anything at this stage. Should I know why that is? Would you be prepared to tell me that? And certainly in private could well have asked that question. The Danes might have said, how can we go that far when we haven't yet worked out how we're going to work together? Will, will our CEO speak to their CEO or will it be the engineers who speak, we don't know any of that. And until we know that, we can't firm up a deal. So any sort of very delicate questioning might have been more useful. Delicate. The mediator could also have resorted to another genuine posture, that of the naive inquirer, on the sound basis that she doesn't and can't know what is in a party's mind. 
She could also have sounded them out in private in order to preserve commercial in-confidence elements of their position, not about the deal, but about their silence. The issue here is the silence, not the, pres not the um, continuation of the deal. That's the surprising part. I'm wondering what to make of your silence and why you aren't putting forward any ideas at this stage. So why a statement instead of a question? Or why a very gentle question? Because there's always the risk that direct questioning will cause offence, both interculturally and interpersonally. If you assume, correctly I would say in the intercultural context, that you don't know what you don't know, you can't ask questions about it. And I know that goes against everything that lawyers are taught. Instead, parties and mediators working interculturally all need to cast a wide net, inviting the other to contribute their views and their ideas. So really good intercultural negotiations have this sort of sound. Look, I'm really interested in why you think that our land can be restored to what it is now after you, BHP Coal, finishes long wall mining on it. Instead of saying, why should we believe you bastards? Being able to say, look, you know, you seem to be suggesting that when you finish long wall mining, somehow the land will be as it always was. You know, tell me why that is. And they could say, well, look, let me hand over to our remediation experts. Let me hand over to the engineers. Let me hand over to these people or these people who've been rehabilitating land for generations. And maybe you'll work with us in the rehabilitation of that land. So the sound of that negotiation changes dramatically when people start to speak to each other in this way which I call casting a wide net. I want to know what it is that you have to tell me which would make me believe you. And that enables the other person to say, well, there's a whole lot of things. Would you like us to tell you how we do this, how we prepare, how we remediate, what we do next? What the, what the royalty regime will be. Believe me, there were heavy negotiations about the royalty regimes in the negotiations between the Girigan and the BHP uh, coal mining in the Bowen Basin. So it's not an underhand tactic to cast a wide net, to ask one of these wide, inviting kind of questions. It's a way of bringing to the surface concerns that might otherwise not have been obvious, obvious to everyone at the table, and to deal with issues at a deep level, not a superficial one. What results from discussions of this nature is that elusive phenomenon, satisfaction. It is the quintessential ingredient of voluntariness, that I'm going to do this because I think it's a good idea, and my people think it's a good idea, so I'm going to go with it. And that is the quality of successfully mediated agreements. To return to the questions posed at the outset by people at the International Law Association conference, if mediation is so successful, why is the convention necessary at all? And why are there so many grounds to oppose enforcement? I suggest that it's precisely because of the complex nature of international transactions that parties will wish to register their agreements and to have the option to set them aside if they fail the durability test, the test of time. I suggest, too, that all too many mediations to date might well have failed that test if they had not been entirely past-focused, as Professor Menkel Meadow so cogently pointed out last year. She foreshadowed the very convention I'm speaking about tonight and what she had to say about quantity versus quality rings in my ears. Now, why should that matter? Let me show you the next slide because this is one I love to show because it sort of encapsulates the fears that people have about mediation. People are very happy to talk about facts and they're very happy to talk about process, and they're very unhappy about talking about feelings. And they're unhappy about talking about feelings 
for reasons that I can't demonstrate today because I can't put my hand in front of the light. But they fear that we will enter the negotiation through the feeling domain. And if I can parody that for a moment, I might say to someone, so, he reminds you of your father. You know, they fear that I will somehow do this kind of psycho babbly, um, touchy feely, uh, all about the feeling stuff. But all of the intercultural stuff is deeply, deeply connected with feeling, with how I feel about my face, how I feel about my community, how you make me feel when you ask me these questions, how I feel about the future working with you. This is all in the feeling domain. So let me d illustrate what I say to business users and international users of mediation. I say that we enter negotiations through the fact domain. So please don't worry that I'm going to ask you whether somebody that you're in dispute with reminds you of your mother. We're going to enter through the fact domain, but we're not going to stay on the boundary. We're going to enter the feeling domain into the lime green, and we're going to discover that some facts are interlinked with feeling. We're also going to continue through the fact domain into the overlap of fact and process. How often have you heard people say, it isn't what happened, it's how it happened. I was fired by text message. So I accept that they were going to fire half of us, but I don't accept that after 20 years they did it by text message. It's fact and process so closely linked together that people can't pull them apart. In the middle, in the brown area, you have to be a hypnotherapist. I promise we leave that alone. In fact, we do a lot of talking about process. But the reason that I put that slide up is that if you stop at the boundary of fact and feeling before you get into the lime green, I hope no one's colorblind. And if you, you somebody probably is, so I've already mucked this whole thing up inter, interculturally. If you stop at the boundary between fact and process and don't enter the grey domain, you end up with 65% of the facts. If you go into fact and feeling interlocking and into fact and process interlocking, you end up with about 80% of the facts and I know where I'd rather be. I would rather know more than less, both as a party and as a mediator. And so I'm prepared to say to people, how did it strike you? I try not to use excessively emotional language. How did it strike you when you learned that they were taking action against you in court? And they say, how did it strike us? We were infuriated. And that's when I get all the emotional stuff. Or we were shocked and horrified that they would do this when we'd been in business with them for 20 years. This is our bank, for heaven's sake and they're proceeding against us and so on. Or they've cut off our line of credit, which was another recent one. So I like to show this to say, we are in the intercultural arena dealing with elements that are deeply felt. And people often don't know how deeply felt they are until we mediators or the other party steps on their cultural toes and says, that's ridiculous, that's irrelevant. We don't need to talk about that. And the moment that happens, you either have breakdown or you have hostility. So we've got to be prepared to look at the intercultural as a kind of feeling dimension, an area that we need to be comfortable with whilst, as I said earlier, reveling in the discomfort that it brings to the people in the chair. Because some of the time we're going to get it wrong, but the parties will help us to get it right. Because as I said to my parties the other day, why don't we have a break? And they said, you be quiet, we're making headway. If you get it wrong, you still get it right. Because if the parties, will, uh, if the parties think you've got it wrong, they'll say, no, 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 it's not like that at all. It's not the fact that they only offered us 1.5% royalties. It's that they said, we will give you this. And they're not giving us anything. We are getting what, we, what is owed us. So we don't like the language they're using. I've heard this hundreds of times. I've heard it in family matters where he says to her, I will let you have the house. And she says, you won't let me have anything. 
We are negotiating for what each of us will take as an outcome of this marriage. No wonder I no longer do any kind of family stuff. I find it much too exciting. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to say about this is that if you never ever sit in an intercultural context, nationally speaking, then everything that I've put on paper, which I hope you'll get a copy of, is equally valid for the culture of different companies. That is to say, when somebody stops working for this particular telco and goes to another telco, it really is like crossing a, ba a boundary, like crossing into another country. And very often the different cultures of organisations are things that we will need to be dealing with in UNCITRAL uh, mediations as well. They're equally valid for uh, corporations as they are for people because they have different cultural mindsets. Some of them are very open, others are very closed. Some welcome teamwork, others reward individual effort. So whether they're collectivist or individualist will have an enormous impact on the way in which the negotiations between them will go. And I often find it difficult when a corporation that would gladly adjourn a mediation because they, are, they need to go and report to their board, they, they would ask me to adjourn the mediation so that they can go to the next board meeting and ask for authority to make a higher offer or to accept some other offer or whatever it might be. They deeply resent when a community group or an Aboriginal group says, we can go no further until we consult our members, or a union. They don't see those things as being analogous to one another. And I immediately think about individualist and collectivist organisations, and I'm able to use that sort of language to remind people that they would regard it as normal in their context, and that in a sense, this is a sort of analogy of the, of the context only in a different setting. I'm going to end by, making a, by quoting uh, your own Chief Justice, whom I had the great pleasure and privilege of hearing at the Global Pound Conference here in 2016. At the inaugural Global Pound Conference held here in March 2016, and at which I had the privilege to be present, Chief Justice Sundaresh Menon identified three major shifts in the global landscape. Just listen to this. Increased economic openness, mobility of labour and capital. Two, increased cross-cultural convergence in transnational commercial dispute resolution. And three, increased recognition of access to justice outside the courtroom. To quote his honour, globalisation has brought with it a sharp increase in the incidence of transnational commercial disputes. However, national legal systems, which were primarily designed to deal with intra-jurisdictional disputes, have struggled to deal efficiently with transnational ones. Indeed, the very existence of different legal systems significantly increases the transactional cost of doing cross-border business. Parties in cross-border business will inevitably have to expend resources in attempting to, to secure pardon me, compliance with a web of national laws and regulations. When disputes arise, they then have to invest further resources to navigate unfamiliar foreign legal systems, often having to rely on unfamiliar foreign counsel, as well as to bear the additional risks that accompany the cross-border enforcement of judgments. On the one hand, these constitute barriers or obstacles to transnational trade. On the other hand, this is the backdrop against which there has been a drift towards cross-cultural convergence in the resolution of these disputes." End of quote. With remarkable foresight, one might almost say clairvoyance, his honour has summed up precisely why the UNCITRAL or Singapore Convention is needed. Now all that remains is for us to make it work. Thank you. <laughs>